and welcome back to our next episode in our Talk Math To Me playlist. I'm your host, Jason Lupke, and I'm very excited to be bringing you our next episode in bringing math discourse to your classroom. So far, we've talked about the value and importance of bringing this important instructional strategy to your classrooms, how to overcome those barriers that might get in the way to implementation, and how to take those first steps towards implementing more talk in your classrooms. So as promised, today we're going to begin looking at the more practical side of implementation. And we'll begin by looking at the four steps towards more productive math talk in your classrooms. Before that though, let's visit with Trisha again. If you remember, Trisha visited with us on our first two episodes in the series. She's a former math teacher and coach and math content expert. Let's hear what Trisha has to say about implementation and what math discourse looks like in action. Okay, so Trisha, we've talked a lot about, um, about what math discourse is, why it's difficult, and how we sort of uh, arrive there. Um, so what, is it, what does it look like in the classroom? Mm -hmm. yeah. Million dollar question. And I think the better question is, what does it sound like? Yeah. So um, when students are engaged in discourse in the classroom, kids are talking about two thirds of the time. And the teacher's talking about a third of the time. And in most, that was something that when I was a coach, um, initially I would go in and I would actually keep track of the number of minutes and seconds the teacher was talking kids were talking, just answering the teacher, talking to each other. I mean, at most 20% of the time kids were talking. And oftentimes of that 20%, it was just responding to whole group questions. So that is a, like a big deal. If, if you as a teacher, you're thinking about questions, and then if you start thinking about how much of the time am I talking, and how much of the time are the kids talking? And then, how much of the time are they talking to each other? That's, that's a bigger goal. Um, the other thing that I would see if I walked into a good math discourse room would be manipulatives or whatever tools students needed were in their workspace, not tucked away neatly on a shelf, just, just in case somebody needs it. Um, when we do that and then we pull them out after we, we're coming to kids that are talking, it, it it contributes to that fixed mindset of, oh, I, I must be dumb. She needed to pull this out. So what I got in the habit of doing was having um, a, a, a bin in the middle that had things that, that for a, a chapter or a unit of study were all common manipulatives that we would be using. And then we would rotate them out. And, you know, th simple things like highlighters. Like, I want kids marking up their text or whatever sheet that we're working on, like make sense of this in a way that works for you. So having those materials right there, kids are grabbing them. If we want to encourage divergent ways of thinking, we need to give them all those tools to be able to use. So I, I would hear kids talking more than teachers. I would see them having access to whatever they needed to solve problems. And I would see a teacher getting his or her steps in that day. So in a, a good math discourse classroom, that teacher needs to be circulating to hear what's going on as kids are talking to one another. So the, the questions that I pose to the, one group of students might be very different than the next group that I, that I stop in and listen in to. And it's going to be responding to what I hear, the work that I see that's on their papers. And when I'm circulating as a teacher, I hope I'm gonna see kids leaning in, right? They're either leaning in to hear because there's kind of a buzz in the room, or they're leaning in to see what do you have on your paper? You know, when I grew up, like eyes in the front, eyes on your paper, that is completely counter to the self-regulatory goal that we're getting for, for feedback. So we wanna see kids leaned in. And I, I wanna be careful here the teacher still is leading the orchestra. So I'm circulating, I'm asking questions different places, but I'm being very purposeful on when I pause for that teachable moment. 
in, in when I was first beginning to be focused on the questions I was asking, I was trying to do two things at the same time. I was trying to embrace this new way of getting kids engaged in talking, and I was hanging on to the way I had been taught. So I would have kids working, I would see where they were, and then I would go through all the steps that they had just been working through. No wonder I always felt I wasn't getting enough done. What I learned over time was I want, I want to be purposeful. When I see most of my groups have it correct, I'm not going to go through all those steps. I'm going to ask them to share what was their aha moment when they were solving with their group. Because that, that's helping them to process, it's helping them to be critical thinkers. Um, when I see several different strategies, I might display all three and ask students, what do you think is the most efficient of these strategies? So, and, and sometimes I'm going to notice, wow, I thought we were ready to apply this in context and we are not. Like, I, I, this is a time for me to actually do some direct instruction. So in a math discourse classroom, I, as a teacher still am in charge of the learning, right? I, I'm still in control and sometimes I still model for students because they need that. But that's happening less of the time rather than all of the time. So um, that idea of, of this teacher on the move is really important part of that math discourse room but also um, that that teacher knows when it's time to pause and process is important. Yeah, and that's that, that's that learning part again, right? Like you, you start to acquire that ability to know when you need to pause and, and the teacher in you sort of come, comes out there, I think. Um, I think probably maybe the most, um, I don't know if I wanna say eye-opening part of what you said there was the two thirds versus one third. I think that's gonna be such a, a a change and a and a, um, a, a altering of the normal for a, for a lot of us as teachers because you know we're probably used to maybe a, a complete opposite of that or um, maybe even more so than than the teacher talking two thirds of the time you know um, so I think that's probably the biggest adjustment that that I heard in there from what we would see in a in a traditional classroom and maybe and, one of the biggest barriers it, it, absolutely but when you begin moving towards that, you are so energized because what you become aware of is how much your students actually know. Uh, you know, I, I would be guilty of making assumptions about where their stumbling blocks were going to be. And just in case I'd be showing this. And when I let go of that control, I was so excited about what my kids knew because then I could extend their learning, right? So. So if we can embrace that, I, I guarantee you, you're going to, to be excited and remember like, this is, this is what I got into education for, that this was the part that my heart spoke to me like, I wanna see this engagement with my students. Okay, so you heard Trisha talk in there about how we must be engaging and talking with our students. She mentioned that oftentimes that might mean that we're modeling for students. And as teachers, we still are in control of the classroom. It's just that there's a little bit less of that, more of our students talking. I loved how she talked about the idea of tracking the amount of time that the teacher spends talking versus the students talking. That's really one of the biggest shifts we have to make in order to move ourselves towards discourse in our math classrooms. If you remember, she threw out that ratio two thirds to one thirds, only that's two thirds of the time students should be talking and only one third of the time that teachers will be talking. That's gonna be a huge shift for a lot of us. So how do we make that shift? What are the steps that we have to put in place to ensure that it will happen? Now it's time for us to get really practical and start talking about those steps towards implementation. We're gonna talk about four steps in the book, Talk Moves. And these are the four steps that we'll focus on here over these next two episodes. And what are those four steps? Well, I asked my colleague and former guest on this playlist, Mohammed Gina, to join us again so that we could talk about those four steps 
and what they might look like in action. So, Mohammed, in, in thinking about how we we get to that point and start implementing, okay, um, you know, there's sort of four different um, areas that we talk about, um, or four steps maybe in getting towards talk moves um, in the classroom. So I'm going to kind of uh, go through those four and maybe just give me your thoughts on those. Um, help us understand what what it means and what it might look like in action. So first one, helping individual students clarify and share their thinking. What does that look like and how do we do that? That's a very important one. Uh, it's about equal access there. It's about um, questions of equity. It's about low, low floors, high ceilings. Have every child needs an entry point. So really being purposeful as the teacher, you know, to help students explain or establish what they know giving them the space and in a comfortable way to be able to do that and encouraging them to be able to do that in a positive way, right? It's not about just getting the child to talk. You know, every child, this kids in my classroom would love to talk and this kids who just didn't want to. And I needed to help them and coach them around that. So it's about getting to know your kids, building good, solid relationships with them, understanding what they like, what they don't, being careful and purposeful, like I said, about the uh, problems you set up for them, um, low floors, high ceilings, many entry points. And it's about creating a comfortable space in your classroom, right? The math classroom needs to be the place where the kids love to go, right? We need, we, we need to change. Oh my God, I have maths now. You know, it, it, oh, I've got maths now, let's go. You know, so um, it's about creating that space. They have to be excited about, about being there. And, that, and, and we as teachers have to take a bit of ownership on that. Yeah. What about uh, the second one is helping students orient to the thinking of others? Super challenging, super challenging. Mm -hmm. And we know this, right? We know this. It's it's coming to a conversation, armored down, coming to a conversation, open hearted, ready to listen and, and know that your truth could be the truth as well. And Brene Brown in her book, Daring Leadership, coins the term rumble where she talks about how she brings her teams together to rumble when they have to solve problems. And like I said, coming to those conversations, prepared to listen, to think, to um, question thinking and ideas, and really look at someone's insight or opinion or take on something as a truth, right? Um, pro probably my, my biggest challenge with trying to get math discourse established in my classroom, but one that you find huge amounts of satisfaction when you start breaking those down. And I think that's that's critically important. You know, you talk about students won't let each other behind, you know, because we're part of a team. And so this this getting students to to um, orient to the thinking of others, that's really important in, in, in achieving that that goal, you know. Um, it's so important. Yeah. What about uh, the third one then is helping students deepen their own reasoning? Mm, it's like, it's, for me, it's like that, like your knee jerk reaction. It's like, oh my God, that's amazing. How did you get that? That's awesome. Being like, oh, that's interesting. Will it always be that way? Why did you get that? How come? What if it changes? What if it, the number was 65? What if there were four boys? What if there were six cars? Would it be the same? What if it is multiply, not divide? If that was an addition sign, not a subtraction, would that still be the same for you? So it's really being purposeful as the teacher and, and helping them, you know, helping them think a bit more deeper, right? Again, goes back to what we said from the beginning. It's appreciating the process and creating time for that process to go further now, not just the answer. Ooh, the, the answer is so one dimensional. It's that's the answer. X is five, move on, right? What if I put a negative two at the end of that? Would it change now? How that affected, right? So certainly like the questions you use, your knee jerk reaction needs to be curated there. Your immediate responses, ask why, think beyond just one answer. If it was to the nth term, what would that look like? And you're really getting your kids to start thinking in a variable sense, which is that big jump from uh, uh, elementary to middle school, right? One way many kids fall off. And it's a really, I, I credit that to the work being done in elementary school where we've just valued the answer. Every time Yusuf gets it right, yes, well done, X is five, move on to the next one, right? He's gonna struggle now, you know? The area 64, 
hmm, if it is two centimeters longer, what do you think it's going to be now? Is that, will it become a rectangle? Or is that a triangle? Or is that a square? What is that one now? You know, so oh, the damage has changed. What if I gave you the radius? Could you calculate it if you had the radius? Right, so you need to deepen their thinking by being very purposeful in how you respond, I think, to their answers. And again, to be able to do that, think about those high ceiling questions. So giving them opportunities to go deeper in a question, not a question that just has one exit point, which can be challenging math, but certainly achievable. I think you said it in there. Um, we talk about valuing the process and not the answer, and that's how we start developing that, that you know, mm. uh, that reasoning within our students. Um, okay, so the fourth one then is, is helping students engage with the reasoning of others then. What does mm. that look like? Mm, very interesting. And one that, trust me, the kids would love, like they absolutely love this. They love to, to understand why you think something or how come. You know, that natural sense of curiosity that kids have, we need to hone in on that big time. And like that example I gave you earlier on here today, where we got our kids to put up their thinking up on the on their boards, and then they had the space to be able to share those. It's about creating those moments, right? Think about where the kids are documenting. Think about how they're sharing. Think about the instruction or the, um, um, or the opportunity that other kids have to work collaboratively on what a child has presented or a position a child has taken or an answer that a child or a process that they've put together. So it's about not you standing at the board and just listening and writing it down, very one directional. It's about getting them to do it in their spaces at that, at that point where the learning is happening. That's where I want the discourse to be taking place, right? And it's working small group, appreciating that doing that in a whole group setting is more challenging. Working in smaller groups is going to be the key. You get your, your groups down to three and four. Of course, more kids are going to have the chance to talk more and express more, explain what they understand, critique the reasoning of others compared to a big whole group. So go small group, create structures and systems where they can document and share the information. And with today's rapid shift to technology, come on, there's so many wonderful digital tools we can use online to be able to do that. Um, whether you're using Lucidchart or Padlet or shared Google Doc or whatever, right? There's so many different wonderful tools schools are using right now and teams are using right now to be able to share information. We need to inculcate those into those classroom spaces, right? And then, of course, go small group, right? Go small group. It's going to give more kids the opportunity to have more time to talk, right? Think about a football game. Right in in 22 players on the field, one ball. There's only so much of time one person can average on the ball. The average is two minutes, by the way. But you go smaller group, make the pitch a whole lot smaller, fewer people inside there. That rapidly jumps up. It's exactly the same. We want to go small group in our classrooms as many times as I can, even for a few minutes, so that they can have that opportunity to talk. Okay. Creates a safer space too. You know, yeah, sure. students are yeah. more willing to share and, yeah. and and engage in that reasoning with others when they're when they're in those smaller groups. So um, fantastic. Well, Mohammed, uh, thanks for taking some time to have the conversation oh, with me today around this course in the math classroom. OK, so that's it for this episode of Talk Math to Me. I hope you've enjoyed our playlist so far. We still have another episode where we'll dig deeper into those four steps towards productive math talk. Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get some really great educational content. We want to hear from you, so send us your feedback. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the HMH International Content Cares YouTube channel. If you're looking for more content, click on the video to the right of your screen. Welcome to our global community.